Okay, I think we'll go ahead and begin. We still may have a few other people joining uh, as we start. Um, but welcome everybody again to our noontime webinars. Um, we've actually come to like these sessions uh, as a way to reach out to people. We thought during the um, shutdown in uh, March, April and May that this was a great way to stay connected, but we actually kind of like, like doing them. Um, if you have any specific topics that you might be interested in hearing about, you know, please share those with us. Um, we're open to any, any suggestions at all. So this is our agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how hair grows. Um, for those of you that have been on previous webinars, some of that might be repetitive, but I think it's particularly important for this topic to understand um, how the hair growth is being affected by other diseases or medications or other situations. Um, there will be questions at the end. We would ask that um, the questions that you, you can type the questions in as we go along. There's a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, um, but we will answer them at the end. Um, I will make every attempt to answer every question. Uh, if, if for some reason, there's a problem when we don't answer your question, please feel free to email us at the info at our website, um, info at meditrust.com, and one of us will get back to you. Okay, so this is me. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Wendell, I'm the medical director for Meditrust. Um, been doing, working with Meditrust for about five years, but I have many more years of experience dealing with female hair loss. Um, I'm actually an internist by training, but I have an extensive um, experience dealing with women, uh, particularly the medical aspects, which is something we're gonna talk a lot about today. Um, we'd like to update our, our um, audience as to where we are in terms of our opening uh, through this very difficult time. We are slowly reopening our Massachusetts offices. Um, we are focusing primarily on treatments a lot of women's treatments got delayed um, or uh, put off until we reopened. So we needed to do those treatments first. Um, we are still doing consults and follow-ups primarily through video. We will slowly be opening the offices to in-person consults and follow-ups, but um, we're sort of taking it by case-by-case -case basis at this point. Uh, we're still playing catch up, but we're getting there. Um, we're hoping in July things will open up a little bit more, but we will keep all of our patients updated. Scarsdale is just now reopening in New York. Um, they've had a particularly rough time, as have we here in, in Massachusetts, but they've particularly been hit hard. And so we're just beginning to open up uh, for treatments. Um, we're still encouraging all consultations and follow-ups be done uh, through video as much as possible. Um, we are always available by phone or video appointments. If you have any questions, you can call us. If you'd like to have a video consult, please um, let us know. All our video appointments, we hope to get people back into the office if they choose to um, over the next few months as things continue hopefully to open up. We highly recommend the video uh, appointments. It's a great way to introduce yourselves to us and us to you, um, particularly at a time when people aren't quite so comfortable yet coming to the office. Just to reassure you, our offices are incredibly safe, but we do understand people's reluctance at this time. So we're very sensitive to that as well. As always, we can always ship products to you um, anytime. Okay, this topic is really, um, quite extensive and something that I think is worth talking about. Um, secondary causes of hair loss, and, or in other words, hair loss is a symptom of another medical problem. I, I got this quote actually off of another um, website, not a hair loss website, but a medical website. Um, hair loss is a common cl clinical complaint and often can be a symptom or manifestation of a wider variety of medical disorders. When someone is diagnosed with a primary hair problem like androgenic alopecia or alopecia areata, usually no further investigations or testing is required. But if it's not that obvious uh, at the first visit, the cause of hair loss, determining the cause of hair loss can be uh, quite a challenge. And that's where we're talking about this particular topic. Okay, a little bit of background science here, uh, just so it makes sense later on when I'm talking about the clinical aspects. Um, so this is what the hair follicle looks like underneath the skin. 
And there are many parts to it, but the parts I'm going to focus on is the bottom, which is called the bulb, which is where the growth takes place. And you'll see um, what's called the hair matrix, which is actually the growth center. That's where the rapidly growing cells sit. And then underneath it is the dermal papilla, which is where the blood supply comes in. If the dermal papilla is, is damaged, the, the nutrients and oxygen can't get to the hair matrix to grow the new hair, hair follicle cells, so the new hair cells. Up towards the top is an area called the bulge, which is where you, the body has its own stem cells, which are stored and essential for new cell growth. If anything, any kind of medical diagnosis or even sometimes treatments can damage the bulb or the, or the, or the bulge, then no growth can take place. And we'll be talking about that. The hair life cycle. Again, if you've sat in our previous webinars, you've seen this uh, chart before, but I don't think it's been any more important than it is right now in terms of what we're going to discuss. Typically, the human scalp has anywhere from 100,000 to 150 hairs. And on an average day, we lose between 50 and 150 hairs per day. 150 will seem like a lot, but that's not actually out of the realm of, of normal for most people. The more hair that you have, the more hair you will lose on a daily basis normally. Um, there are three phases to this normal hair life cycle. The longest phase is the antigens, where the actual growth phase um, takes place and can last anywhere from two to six years. That's a long time for a hair follicle to be doing its work. At any one moment, about 90% of our hair should be in this growth phase. Once the growth phase is over, the follicle goes into the catagen phase, which is considered the transition phase. It's when things start to change, when the lower portion of the follicle starts to regress and pull away. This catagen phase can last just a couple of weeks and less than 1% of the hair should be in catagen phase at any one time. The last section is the telogen phase and we'll be talking about that one a lot in the future in the, towards the, um, the middle of this discussion. The telogen phase is where no further nourishment comes to the hair follicle and it actually prepares to fall out and then does fall out. The actual process of falling out is sometimes called the exogen phase. Up to 10% of the hair is normally or in a telogen phase at any one time. So that is what is considered normal. Over time, as we age, this growth cycle does shorten so that even under normal circumstances, you tend to have more shedding as we age, which is also why it's very hard for older women to grow really, really long hair. I'm always impressed when I see an older woman come in. When I say older postmenopausally, I'm in that group, please don't be offended. Um, I'm always impressed when a woman comes in with long, long hair who is postmenopausal because it's very, very unusual. Typically, you get to about your shoulder length, and that's about as far as it will grow. Um, hair loss can occur due to disorders of this cycling. And so you can have inflammation that actually damages the hair follicle. Um, you can have acquired abnormalities of the hair shaft, which I'm not going to talk about at all because they're extremely unusual. and um, typically present um, as just funny hairs. It's really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of them, but they're, they're pretty rare. So I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, we will spend a fair amount of time talking about excessive shedding, um, both telogen effluvium, which a lot of us know a lot about, and antigen effluvium, uh, which is the hair loss that's associated with chemotherapy. Okay, disorders of the growth cycle. Antigen effluvium, which I stated, was um, when the growth cycle is actually um, damaged and the hair falls out when it should be growing. So this is most typically post-cancer hair loss. Um, it's an increasingly um, common problem as fortunately we're seeing more and more women and men survive their cancers. The cure rates of cancers is steadily increasing over time. Um, the treatments are improving. However, um, there are still a lot of cancer treatments, chemotherapy, which do cause hair loss. So antigen effluvium is shedding during the actual growth phase as a result of an acute interruption of the growth phase, usually due to very strong medications, what we would call cytotoxic or chemotherapeutic drugs in the treatment of cancer. The good news is that usually it is reversible. Um, however, um, there's been a lot of studies on women and hair loss due to cancer treatment. The majority of the studies and observational, both uh, 
treatment as well as observation, are, are a lot of the studies been done in women with breast cancer and ovarian cancer. But those show that up to 40% of women have some degree of permanent loss or what's called PCIA, permanent chemotherapy-induced alopecia. Now, it doesn't mean you don't get hair regrowth, but what it does mean is you don't get complete hair regrowth. And we see this a lot in our practice. This can be emotionally devastating. And um, it's interesting because you think, yes, it's absolutely devastating to have the cancer diagnosis, but then to add the emotional loss due to the hair loss, it's just an added uh, trauma emotionally. And the amount of hair loss can be extremely variable. Uh, it can be from patchy loss to just complete baldness. It's interesting because you'd think that getting treatments every week would be much more likely to cause extensive loss, but in fact, weekly treatments, which tend to be not quite as strong, um, generally result in slower loss and at times incomplete alopecia, which means hair loss. High dose chemotherapy, which is given every two to four weeks, um, which tends to be more intensive therapy, tends to cause more loss and, and, and result in um, complete baldness in some women. Again, some chemotherapy agents um, can result in prolonged and sometimes permanent alopecia, even once the chemotherapy is done. Um, particularly breast cancer drugs, um, they're called the taxol groups, docetaxol, patataxol. These are names that some of you who've had breast cancer treatments are probably familiar with. Other types of chemotherapy used for lung cancers and um, other types of cancers called cisplatinum, which has been used for decades, and busulfan are also known for very prolonged and sometimes permanent alopecia. Now, the reversibility of this alopecia depends on the degree of damage done at the time of treatment. And the damage can be in the bulb, which, as you remember, is at the very bottom of the hair follicle, which is where it grows, the growth comes from, or the bulge where the stem cells are stored. If there's damage done there, then you don't have the stimulation for new growth. There are multiple factors which can influence the severity of loss. Anybody who's had prior scalp irradiation, um, that oftentimes can lead to some permanent patchy loss. Unfortunately, increasing age also makes it more difficult to have regrowth. If you have a background of uh, female pattern hair loss that existed prior to the chemotherapy, that also puts you at greater risk for loss. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you've had primal chemo prior chemotherapy from other tumors, uh, that also makes it more difficult for the hair to recover. On top of that, um, particularly with breast cancer treatment, there are oftentimes uh, medications that are continued after the initial chemotherapy, which are used to prolong long-term remission. Some of these drugs can also cause what is felt to be reversible loss, such as the aromatase inhibitors, anastrozole and let letrozole, and the estrogen modulators like tamoxifen and raloxifen. These treatments are very common post-chemotherapy for breast cancer, and they can also um, create poor growth once, poor regrowth once the IV chemotherapy is um, finished. We see a lot of this in the office and it just adds a little bit of more difficulty in terms of treating uh, hair loss. Not impossible, but more challenging. <clears throat> I put this slide up here uh, in dark red ink because I, my intent here is not to tell people they shouldn't take their chemotherapy. And, I, and sadly, there are cases where um, people have refused treatment. I have had patients that have refused treatment because they don't want to lose their hair. And we have the ability to help people now. And it shouldn't, so this shouldn't be part of the conversation about whether to get chemotherapy or not. And please don't consider this means you should stop your um, anastrozole, uh, the aromatase inhibitors, um, or the estrogen um, modulators. These are medications that are life-saving. We can work with them. So please don't consider stopping these medications. It's too important. <clears throat> okay, what can we do to decrease the amount of loss uh, with chemotherapy? And it's interesting because um, once the chemotherapy is stopped, within a few weeks, the hair generally starts to grow back. 
But in 65% of cases, it's interesting, it grows back differently. And what does that mean? Well, it can, the texture can be different. What was once straight is now curly. Once what was curly is now straight. The color can come back differently. And that's not just because you're not dyeing your hair anymore. It can come back gray or even a different color altogether, which is really fascinating. Eventually over time, the hair tends to go back to where it was before chemotherapy, but it takes almost a year or longer for hair to fully recover from chemotherapy. <clears throat> so is there anything you can do to prevent loss? Um, there's been some um, research done and some treatment with called, what's called scalp hypothermia. They're called cold caps. And the success of this, this treatment is variable, depends on the type of chemotherapy, and of course those other issues that we mentioned. Um, the cap is placed on 30 minutes before the IV infusion of your chemotherapy and is left on for one to four hours after. Most of the research done on the cool scalp uh, caps has been done on breast cancer treatment. And the best treatment, the best results shown in research shows that up to 50% of those treated had some degree of improvement. Doesn't mean they didn't lose any hair, but the feeling is they may have lost, um, they don't lose as much. Um, there are some issues with the, the cool cap. It's, it's uncomfortable, some people get headaches. Um, how this actually works is the cold actually causes the blood vessels in the scalp to, to tighten up or constrict so that the chemotherapy can't get to the hair follicle. It also slows down the growth. It sort of puts it, the hair follicles into a temporary hibernation so that by the time they get re-stimulated to grow, the chemotherapy is out of the system. Um, but again, overall, it's pretty well tolerated. It's not considered standard treatment. I know there are hospitals in Boston that do offer it. Um, sadly, insurance does not always cover it and it is expensive, um, but it's very personal as to whether people want to try it or not. So are there any things that we can do um, once, once treatment is over to help recover? And um, the answer is yes. Um, there are some topical treatments. It's interesting, there's something called Latisse, which many people have heard about. Um, it's the prostaglandin analog, which is used to re-stimulate growth in eyelashes and eyebrows. There have been some research, some research done on, on whether it can be used on scalp hair, um, and it does seem to help, but the amount of solution needed to treat an entire scalp is uh, a lot. And unfortunately, um, research hasn't come up with a solution that is practical at this point. I do think in the future though, um, this may be important as research is ongoing. Um, minoxidil 5%, um, studies do show that, although it didn't prevent the hair loss from happening with the chemotherapy, but it did shorten the duration of time of recovery to maximal regrowth. And then low, low level laser therapy, we use this for um, genetic hair loss, as well as uh, sometimes and, um, alopecia areata. Um, but the laser therapy actually stimulates the hair follicle to restart growth. I've actually seen laser and minoxidil work well on patients who haven't had treatment for the hair loss for up to three to four years. So they've, they've, they've dealt with their thin hair from chemo. They come in and we try it and indeed, as long as this, the hairs are there and the follicles are still present, sometimes you can get regrowth to come back, which is great. Um, we sometimes would recommend um, PRP or optimal platelet concentration, again, depending on um, what we saw on examination. And I can't stress enough the importance of nutritional support and supplements. Um, after a woman has gone through chemotherapy, frequently they've lost weight. The nutritional status is um, not as good. So it's important to rebuild that. Now, somebody had asked me, what's the best time to start regrowth stimulation? Which is a great question. As I said, hair starts to regrow and recover within a few weeks of the end of chemotherapy. And as long as the scalp skin is healthy, that's the time to start. Um, some people do get some irritation of, of skin, not necessarily just scalp, but skin, um, as a result of the chemotherapy, side effects of the chemotherapy. So if there's any irritation or, or ulcerations of the scalp, clearly that has to wait until um, all of that is healed. But interestingly, most women um, don't have any problem with their skin of the scalp. Even though they've lost hair, the scalp is actually in pretty good shape. So if the scalp is healthy, Within a couple of weeks, that's when you start the regrowth stimulation. Okay, um, telogen effluvium. Telogen effluvium is actually a very common 
um, hair loss problem we see a lot in the practice. Fortunately, most of the time it's temporary. Um, it can be acute, meaning sudden onset, lasting a relatively short period of time, or chronic, lasting many years. Usually the acute telogen effluvium has a causative factor. It rarely can become chronic, but if it doesn't resolve after about a year, then we start to get concerned that we're sliding into a chronic stage. Telogen effluvium, as you recall in that first few slides, telogen is the time when hair normally falls out. Should be less than 10% of our hairs, but during a telogen effluvium, it's a greater percentage. It presents as a diffuse hair loss. It comes from all parts of the scalp. Women come in and say they see their hair everywhere. They see it on their clothing. They see it on their counters. They see it in their brush. They see it on the floor. Um, it's, it's very distressing when you see it. Um, and it's really quite obvious. I had a telogen effluvium after the birth of my first child. I didn't know much about it at that time. I was very young and still in my training. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna lose all my hair. Fortunately, it stopped after a few months, which it oftentimes does, and it all grew back. Um, again, most commonly, a woman will see increased shedding. The hair is everywhere. It's usually reversible, and, and we'll talk about potential treatments in a minute, um, and usually complete regrowth occurs within a year. Now, it's important that you treat the underlying cause we make a pretty concerted effort to find out what that underlying cause is. And then we treat the underlying cause plus doing the, uh, treating the hair loss itself with stimulation. Unfortunately, about a third of the time, no cause can be found, which is incredibly frustrating because we know if we can find that cause, it'll speed recovery. The typical time frame for the loss to occur is two to four months following a particular event. Um, and the loss can last, as I said, up to about a year. Now, interestingly, um, some people can notice the shedding coming on sooner. I will tell you through this whole coronavirus pandemic, we heard from a lot of women, including some of the women in our office, who within a month of the shutdown noted extreme shedding of their hair. And these women tended to have issues with their hair to begin with, which makes you more susceptible to a telogen effluvium. But it didn't take the typical two to four months. It was within a few weeks. So again, if the insult is particularly stressful, particularly difficult, it can happen sooner. Once the shedding is under control, it can take six to 12 months for recovery to take place. Now, it's amazing that you can lose up to 50% of the hair, because that's a lot, and it, it creates a, a very obvious change in how your, your appearance looks. But progression to complete baldness does not occur. This picture shows a woman who has obvious loss, particularly in the temples. The good news is with, with recovery, those areas should fill in. Okay, the causes. <laughs> the causes, the list of causes for telogen effluvium is extensive. Um, I've listed the most um, um, common ones here, but the list is bigger than what I've listed here. Um, nutritional deficiencies is one of the most common causes of excessive shedding. Protein, if you don't get enough protein in your diet, you don't make good hair. A vitamin D deficiencies, um, again, skin and hair need vitamin D to stay healthy. Iron deficiencies in women is probably the number one cause of um, telogen effluvium. Women over the course of decades lose a little bit of, of blood on, uh, every month, and by the time they're in their mid 40s, they actually are iron deficient, uh, enough to cause shedding. If you add any illness on top of that or any bleeding, the shedding becomes quite uh, profound. Folate and B12 deficiencies also can cause um, excessive shedding. Now, rapid weight loss can do this. And also there are certain diets that are not actually beneficial for hair. The keto diet is terrible for hair. Um, you will lose weight cl very quickly, but you will also lose hair. Um, Sadly, young women with eating disorders, we oftentimes see them coming in with uh, excessive shedding and unhealthy hair. Um, surgery, anybody who has uh, a profound illness requiring surgery, sometimes the anesthetics, just the stress of the body stress of being, uh, having surgery is enough to cause shedding. Especially bariatric surgery, which is weight loss surgery, um, the rapid weight loss, in addition to the shock of the surgery itself, oftentimes uh, ends up with a telogen effluvium. 
any kind of medical illness, uh, particularly if someone has a high fever, they can experience a transient uh, telogen effluvium. Psychological stress. This, I, can't, I can't emphasize this enough. The worst case of telogen effluvium I have ever seen was in an older woman who had horrific emotional, personal stress, real problems in her family. She was just beside herself with emotion and she lost 50% of her hair. I didn't even believe that it was truly just due to stress. <clears throat> so I worked her up as I work up everybody looking for other causes. There was nothing else. And her husband came in and said, this all occurred within a few months, which was incredible because it was a huge loss. Fortunately, with some stimulation, she started to regrow her hair back. And within a few months, uh, things started to turn around. But it was psychological stress is a, is a huge factor. It affects our bodies tremendously in many, many ways. And the hair sort of gives us a, a clue that something's going on. Hormone imbalances, um, particularly in women, um, there, sadly, there are some birth control pills that are in favor of hair growth and cause shedding. Sometimes just changing from one birth control to another will do that. The progesterone-only birth controls, like the Mirena IUD, can cause excessive shedding. Um, a lot of postmenopausal women are getting uh, bioequivalent uh, hormones. Uh, a lot of uh, clinicians, unfortunately, are giving testosterone, which is terrible for hair and can cause shedding. So balance, imbalances of your, of your hormones, particularly the, the um, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, any kind of imbalance there can cause shedding. And so we do, when we're evaluating people, we do check those levels. Seasonal changes. Um, interestingly enough, um, humans do, do shed seasonally. It's not consistent. I personally shed in the fall. Um, I'm still waiting to get my telogen effluvium from coronavirus, which unfortunately I think is starting to happen now. But seasonal changes can be fall or spring. Uh, excessive sun exposure can actually make you shed more. You'd think that being in the sun, getting the vitamin D would help the hair, but in fact, acutely, it actually can cause excessive shedding. Um, certain endocrine disorders, particularly thyroid. If you have hypo or too little or hyper, too much thyroid hormone, you can get shedding at both extremes. And then scalp conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, lupus, seborrheic dermatitis, any inflammation of the scalp can cause a telogen effluvium. can also just cause hair loss separate from the telogen effluvium, but it, it can cause telogen effluvium. So the list is pretty extensive. Um, chronic telogen effluvium, as I mentioned, if the shedding lasts for more than um, a year, I, I, it's got six months here, but actually it's more than a year. We start to get concerned that people are sliding into a chronic telogen effluvium. Most people do not get chronic, but some do. And so it's interesting because they can go through periods of improving and then getting worse. The relapses are often associated with times of extreme emotional stress. And then once that resolves, they'll get some regrowth again. And then something else will happen, whether it's physical or emotional and then it starts up again. It's a very frustrating and very difficult um, problem. As with the telogen effluvium, the diffuse is, is, I mean, the loss is diffuse, meaning the whole scalp can be affected. More noticeable in the temples. Uh, this woman had extensive loss in the temples. Um, and interesting because you can get full recovery and then start having loss again a year or so later. Typically, it, it occurs actually in women who have um, very thick hair to start out with. It's more common in women between the ages of 40 and 60. So, you know, just before menopause or during, um, and it can wax and wane for many, many years, but interestingly enough, can just stop after five to seven years. So, you know, we do look for causes. We do all the same evaluations as we do for a telogen effluvium, but um, again, oftentimes don't necessarily find a cause and um, it goes away. Fortunately. Um, so what do we do when someone comes in? Even though we know it still may just be a telogen effluvium, we do a, a thorough evaluation because you can have more than one issue going on at the same time. We take a complete medical history, we get a list of all their medications, um, we do a complete physical examination of the scalp, determine the health of the scalp itself. We do what's called trichoscopy, which is a magnification of the hair follicles and of the scalp, so we can evaluate lesions that we find, evaluate the health, the health of the hair follicles themselves. Um, there's something called a pull test, where we actually pull out a little bit of the hair, see how easy it is to extract the hair from the follicle. If a lot of hairs come out with a little bit of pull, then that's a telogen effluvium. 
Uh, sometimes it doesn't take much, but even just pulling, manipulating the hair, not even pulling, but just playing with the hair a little bit, you'll get you know, 10, 15 hairs, which is a lot, and that's diagnostic of a telogen effluvium. As I said, lab evaluation is very important. We do check a CBC, we check iron levels, ferritin levels, which is a measure of your iron stores. Thyroid uh, levels are done. We do some nutritional uh, evaluations with vitamin D. Some of the B vitamins we will do also depending on the individual. Uh, zinc, low zinc levels can cause excessive shedding and hormone levels are very important. Um, as I mentioned for myself, I had a telogen effluvium postpartum. That's very, very common. Um, the vast majority of women with postpartum telogen effluvium don't need any evaluation except to say that postpartum, most women are anemic. And so it's be important um, to check a blood count just to make sure the anemia is resolving and that their iron stores are full. Because if that's part of the problem, if you give them iron supplementation, it gets better faster. Rarely um, would we require a scalp biopsy, but we do once in a very blue moon, if we've checked everything, we cannot come up with a diagnosis and it's ongoing, then sometimes we'll do a scalp biopsy just to make sure we're not missing something. Okay, so what do we do for telogen effluvium? Um, again, the most important thing is that we find, we look for a particular cause, because as I just said, if there's something underlying as a cause, if you don't treat that cause, it's not gonna go away. You might get a little better with other types of treatments, but it'll be ongoing if you don't get to that cause. Now, sometimes just treating the causative effect, the causative factor will, will um, result in improvement. Um, and so people can recover very quickly. If, for instance, again, if you're iron deficient, you get them on iron within a month or two, they're starting to get better. But if not, then there are other treatments that can help minimize further shedding and stimulate recovery. We sometimes will use minoxidil, but again, we do this carefully because minoxidil itself can cause a little bit of shedding in the first couple of weeks. And the last thing we wanna do is cause more anxiety over it. It doesn't cause permanent shedding, but again, um, we do use it, but we use it carefully and um, we pick and choose the right conditions under which to use it. Low level laser therapy oftentimes can be very helpful. And again, for people who are sliding into a chronic telogen, uh, excuse me, a chronic um, telogen effluvium, then we may indeed use minoxidil and laser therapy to stimulate growth, to get those follicles moving again. The LOC, LOC RX system um, can also be useful to stimulate regrowth if there's microneedling, but again, this is after we've done a complete thorough evaluation and we've determined hopefully a cause. Nutritional supplements, I think virtually everyone with a, a telogen effluvium, acute and chronic, should be on some kind of nutritional supplement. We do find that it does help a lot. Um, we, we encourage increased protein in the diet. I would say at a minimum 60 grams of protein a day for most women. Um, the next one should say iron therapy. Um, we want to get the ferritin level to more than 65. Some, some researchers will say get it to 100 if someone has ongoing shedding. So we will push it uh, in those individuals. Interestingly, L-lysine supplements can also help with uh, particularly chronic telogen effluviums. Uh, we're not sure why that is the case, but that is a, uh, a component of protein that is necessary for hair health. There are several good uh, supplements out there, and we certainly can give you more information if you're interested. Nutrif we, we recommend Nutrafol or the Lock RX system. There are pros and cons to each of them, so we do, um, we do fine tune them and decide which one is best for who. Um, in terms of platelet-rich therapy, platelet uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma therapy, or, or OPC, or optimal platelet therapy, um, again, it would depend on the individual. It's not considered standard treatment for telogen effluvium. It might be considered for someone who has chronic telogen effluvium and is not responding to anything else. The, the last statement is very true. Chronic tel telogen effluvium can be extremely challenging and difficult to treat. Many times we don't find a cause and it's difficult to, doesn't often respond to treatment. Very frustrating for the patients. Um, a lot of reassurance and we, st we stick close to these patients and, and, and support them and continue treatment until we know they're getting better. Okay, can medications cause hair loss? Um, I, I, the answer is yes, um, it, they can. Um, 
The list is long. In fact, almost every medication, if you read the insert that comes with the drugs from the pharmacy, I think none of us would take any medications, but a lot of times they'll list alopecia as a side effect. Most of the time it's less than 1% that it's, it's um, been noted. But I will tell you that even though it can be listed, um, other than chemotherapy, medications rarely are the primary cause of hair loss. So with that in mind, and patients come in and say, I think my medicines might be doing this, I don't generally recommend changing medications unless there really is a strong time component relationship, meaning somebody comes in, says, I started this new medicine two months ago, and now look at my hair. And indeed, you know, through exam, I can see that it's shedding. And I personally would never tell someone to stop their medication. We would work with their primary care physician and, and together come into agreement as to what the next step should be. And um, again, do not recommend anybody stop their medication if they think it's due to hair, that it's, due, it's causing their hair loss, because again, rarely is it ever the primary cause. Having said that, <laughs> um, here's a list of some common medications that many of us are on, myself included, um, that can cause um, some shedding. I will tell you strongly that testosterone in any form can cause hair loss. And any woman who's concerned about their hair should not be on testosterone. That is the one strong statement I will make. Um, if you're on testosterone and your hair is falling out, you need to call your doctor who's prescribing it and say, I need to get off this. That is the one caveat to what I just said about not stopping your medication. Um, progesterone only birth control pills, as I mentioned before, can cause hair loss. The Mirena is the IUD that has progesterone only. The other hormones that can cause excessive loss are if you're on too much thyroid supplements. And I will tell you that there are a lot of functional doctors uh, and hormone specialists that are giving women low dose thyroid to try to stimulate metabolism. And yes, your thyroid may be within normal range, which is good. But if it's not, if it's pushing your thyroid test to out of normal range, that can sometimes cause shedding. So that needs to be monitored carefully. And the hormones that are done topically on the skin, the absorption can be variable. So you need to have those levels checked regularly. Again, the chemotherapy agents, the aromatase inhibitors, um, we do know can cause uh, loss. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, this is you know, your, your favorite Advil, um, ibuprofen, naproxen, um, can do it again. Um, I wouldn't stop it if you need them for your arthritis and for pain. Beta blockers are heart medication. A lot of um, antidepressants, lithium antidepressants can cause some hair loss. Blood thinners, gout medication. The amphetamines, which are used for ADHD and ADD, they're stimulants that can cause shedding. Methotrexate is another kind of chemotherapeutic agent, but is also used uh, for rheumatoid arthritis in low doses. Again, I can't stress enough, never stop any medications without discussing it first with your doctor. And again, I can't stress this in enough. In most cases, the hair loss is not due to the medication. So don't just stop the medicines and hope for the best. Take it in a stepwise fashion. Talk to your doctor. Have an honest discussion and see what they say. Okay, again, never, never, never stop a medication without talking to your prescribing physician first. I just want to make that very clear. Um, again, because the vast majority of times, it's not the medication. I've seen it be medication, but the vast majority of times it is not the medication. Okay, briefly, we're just gonna talk about hair loss that can be caused from inflammation of the scalp from an other type of illness. We'll just go through a few of these. Basically, again, systemic illness, that means affecting the entire body, and the hair loss is just one of many symptoms of this particular problem. Some autoimmune disorders uh, in women are, are fairly common, and um, they often can cause inflammation of the scalp as a secondary problem to the illness. This is a really tough photo. This is somebody who has discoid lupus erythematosus. And lupus is, is not uncommon uh, in women. Um, it's an autoimmune disorder. Um, and most people don't get skin issues. Um, it can affect other organs, including kidneys, lungs, uh, skin, and hair. Some people just have skin issues and not the internal organ type. So typically in young women, um, and uh, the scalp can become inflamed with plaques like this. Um, it should be um, hopefully um, caught soon enough so that the area uh, can be limited. But if the, if the hair follicle is damaged due to the, um, the lupus, then you won't get regrowth in that area. So important to get any kind of inflammation on your scalp checked 
quickly. Also, scarring from radiation therapy. Unfortunately, again, the hair follicles can be destroyed by the radiation, which in some cases is intense. But um, it's, it's a little deceiving. You know, people who have hair loss uh, following radiation therapy are assuming that there cannot be regrowth. But when I take a look at the scalp under microscopy, I can see the hair follicle. And sometimes we can see small little hairs still coming out. So those hair follicles may not all be gone. And so if you, as long as you're seeing the follicle and the small hair coming out of it, um, it's worth trying to stimulate that hair to come back. And I've seen improvement. The other types of scarring alopecias are primary hair issues. Um, and I've listed them here, but we're not gonna talk about them. Those are primary hair issues. But I will tell you, interestingly enough, some of these can be associated with other autoimmune disorders. And autoimmune disorders are more, more common in women. And so um, if you're having a hair issue and you know you have autoimmune disorder, um, you know, talk to your doctor. Okay, um, other non-scarring, meaning non-permanent hair losses from um, other issues. Um, Non-scarring, this is actually non-scarring, not scarring. Non-scarring um, is usually not permanent. Usually we can get uh, reversal and improvement. Um, Pressure-induced post-op alopecia, um, actually, um, I've seen this. Um, a woman can have surgery and during a prolonged surgical procedure, the patients unfortunately are left in one position and you can get pressure uh, sores and actually hair loss from areas that are usually um, where the patient's maintained in the same position for long periods of time. The hair loss won't happen right away. It can happen a few weeks down the line, um, but it's temporary and, and usually you get complete growth. Trichotillomania is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, it's due to repeated plucking or pulling of hair due to emotional stress, usually temporary and grows back. But if there is no treatment, then sometimes some of the hair follicles might not uh, come back. This photo is actually somebody who has trichotillomania, so it can be quite extensive. Um, but fortunately, a lot of that will recover with treatment, and there is treatment. And so um, the good news is it's probably not permanent. Psoriasis and eczema, very common scalp problems. I have a little psoriasis on my scalp itself. 80% um, of people with psoriasis will have a flare-up on the scalp. Um, and again, usually it can be um, easily noticed. It's quite itchy. Um, you can, if you don't get treatment for it, much like the trichotillomania, over long periods of time, you sometimes can have um, permanent loss in small areas. But most of the time it is um, reversible. And if you treat the underlying problem, if you treat the psoriasis, you treat the, the eczema, then the hair will, um, will grow back. And then infection, tinea capitis, which is a, um, a fungal infection on the scalp, can involve the entire scalp. It's more common in children, um, but we see it once in a while in adults. Or cellulitis of the scalp, if somebody gets an infection, you can have you know, hair loss or areas where there doesn't appear to be hair growing. The good news is you treat the underlying infection and the hair will grow back. Okay, so I've actually gone through a lot of information, a lot of technical information as well. Um, we have a few questions here, so I'm gonna address those right now. Um, okay. Okay, well, the first question is, I have both massive hair shedding and very long hair. What might this indicate? As I said, the answers um, really could be from many different things. Um, and an extensive evaluation would include um, having your scalp looked at, having the follicles examined under microscope, um, and, and most likely um, some blood work and other testing to be done to determine the cause. Uh, massive hair shedding, you know, you're talking about a lot of hair shedding. It still could be just a telogen effluvium, but um, we need to, you would need to find out why. And treating the underlying problem is, is so important because if you start doing hair stimulation treatments, it's not gonna get you very far unless the underlying treatment and the underlying cause isn't found in treatment. Um, again, it could be stress. And, but again, what I would say is that you need to be evaluated with other types of um, testing, including blood work and, and a physical, good physical exam before um, embarking on any kind of treatment. When you have very long hair, hair shedding is much more obvious. Um, 
men don't complain about hair shedding that much because their hairs are short, they don't look at them, they disappear, and they don't see them anywhere. When you have long hair, you see it everywhere. You see it in the tub, you see it in the shower, you see it on the counter, you see it in the sink. The longer the hair, the more obvious it is. If you have a lot of hair to start with, I have not a lot of hair. So if I shed, you know, 15% of my hair, it's not going to look as bad as someone who has, you know, 200,000 hairs and they're shedding 15% of those. It's going to be a lot more. So again, um, a thorough evaluation is absolutely necessary. Um, the next question is, um, if you have chronic telogen effluvium, and unfortunately um, she's had it um, for a while, um, what specific blood work? I, I, would, I would recommend um, all the blood work I, I listed. I would do a blood count. I would do a ferritin and an iron level. I would do vitamin levels, uh, vitamin D, vitamin, all the vitamin B levels, the, the folate and B12. I would check thyroid levels. I would check hormone levels, both estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and uh, thyroid levels. I would check a zinc level if I didn't mention that already. Um, Everything that I listed, someone who has chronic TE, and I have a handful of patients now that we're dealing with, we've checked those levels. We also, if things are not improving, I might then do even more uh, involved testing to look for an autoimmune disorder like lupus or um, other types of chronic inflammatory problems that um, women can get and can only be diagnosed really carefully with blood work. An ANA, a SED rate, what's called a CRP, which is a, um, uh, it's looking for, for systemic inflammation. So all those things should be done. Um, one thing I didn't mention, and I probably should have, I didn't put it on the webinar, is that I am a strong believer in the anti-inflammatory diet. And a lot of what we eat uh, causes and creates inflammation in our bodies, including in our hair follicles. So if you want to know, the anti-inflammatory anti diet is zero processed foods, a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, very little to no red meat, which has a lot of inflammatory process, uh, products in the, in the meat. Um, but if you want to get any further information, if you go online and you just uh, Google um, anti-inflammation diet, you will get a lot of information. And I, I recommend all of us to be following that diet. So, but particularly in women, who have a tendency for more inflammation, particularly the autoimmune disorders. An anti-inflammatory diet is very, very, very helpful. Um, next question, um, good one. Will wearing a topper hair piece made of human hair cause follicle damage or permanent hair loss? Unfortunately, what happens if you wear uh, the topper all the time, the hair underneath does get macerated and gets the, pushed down and so, what we see is that those follicles tend to get smaller over time. And so I'm not suggesting not wearing the hair piece. And so if, if you've come to a point in your hair loss uh, journey that you, you, you feel like you've done as much as you can and you're not comfortable with where you are, wear the hair piece, but understand that there's probably not going to be much that we can do underneath it if you're wearing that hair piece all the time. Some women come to us if they've just started wearing it or they're just at a point where they're considering it. And we have a very honest conversation. And we say, you know, I ask them, do you want to keep trying to stimulate those hairs to come back? Or are you at a point where you've done everything that you think you can do and, and you're just not comfortable? Because again, it's, it's hard to keep doing things. And if you're not getting benefit to keep keep doing it. Um, things are, are improving. We're coming up with new treatments all the time. And so, you know, I have that honest conversation. And a lot of women will say, I want to keep trying something that might be new that I haven't tried before or haven't gotten the best advice in the, in the past. Um, so we might take a more aggressive approach for a period of time. So what I tell women to do, wear the hairpiece when you're out, if, you can, if it's a clip on and off. And when you come home, take it off. Let the scalp get some air, get, let the follicles um, breathe, for lack of a better term. Um, because again, if, you, if it's there on all the time, those follicles underneath, unfortunately, will begin to regress. Um, next question. How can you tell if the bulge is, is damaged? Um, you, I can't tell looking at it. Even under the microscope, I can't tell. Um, 
when, when someone is experiencing profound hair loss uh, from, from chemotherapy, for instance, or from other types of toxic um, entities, for lack of a better term, it's very possible that the bulge is being damaged. Um, so what we do is we try to stimulate that to come back as soon as they're done with the chemotherapy, as soon as they're done with what other treatment might be causing that type of problem. I will tell you that radiation therapy, high, high intense, um, especially the, 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 the beam radiation therapy, which is in high intense radiation in small areas, it most likely will damage the bulb. Doesn't mean that you can't get any growth back. Um, it just makes it less likely and, and more difficult. So it's not something we can see. It's really something we're left with when we try to get hair to recover and we're not seeing that happen. Um, next question, a tough one. Um, when should you get worried if you've had chemo and your hair isn't uh, growing back? Um, everybody's different. You know, the standard is your hair should, you should start seeing some recovery within three to four weeks. It should start, begin to come back. But in all honesty, it may take, um, you know, several months for you to really start see, seeing that to happen. And honestly, unless there's a reason to not start treatment, I, I would recommend starting treatment sooner than later. And, and with that, I mean like minoxidil or laser therapy with the guidance of, of somebody who can recommend properly um, what to do. I don't, there's no, as I said, the studies have shown that stimulating the hair follicles the, so, shortly after you're done with chemotherapy, studies have shown using minoxidil and or laser will get you to regrowth at a faster rate and most likely will get you to that more functional hair. Because initially the hairs that come back are very fine baby-like hairs and they don't tend to um, have a lot of structure to them. What minoxidil and laser does is it makes them be healthier and stronger. So I, I wouldn't wait as long as the scalp is, is healthy. Um, I would encourage people to start as soon as possible. Okay. Um, you have, uh, okay, Rath, keep, this, is a, this is an interesting, very uh, unusual problem. Somebody has a possible pituitary adenoma. Um, it's not everybody who has pituitary adenomas uh, has hair loss. Um, the pituitary is our um, super gland that manages all of our hormones and um, it, it manages thyroid, it manages all of them. So hair loss can be a function of that. Um, but again, if you have a pituitary adenoma or the cyst, um, your doctor should know to, to test you for all of those hormone levels. That's part of the workup. It's very extensive. It's very complicated and, and most likely um, being followed by a, a, a specialist in this field. And those hormones um, will tell you where you are. And if you have um, some um, thyroid problems or your, or, um, your female hormones are not uh, in normal range or your cortisol is out of range. Those are the types of things that can cause hair loss. And so what they do is they, they will medicate you with appropriate treatments to get those um, hormones back into a normal uh, range. But it's, it's a discussion that if in fact you have those abnormalities, considering treatment for hair loss early rather than waiting for it to be an issue is not a problem. You can start treatment right away. And so getting, getting a complete evaluation, getting those hormone levels checked, seeing where you're at, um, and talking to a hair loss uh, expert, talking to the endocrinologist, um, very important, get that done quickly. Because elevated cortisol levels, higher low cortisol levels can cause hair shedding, higher low high thyroid hormones can cause shedding, higher low estrogen, progesterone, testosterone levels can cause shedding. All of those things can be affected. So important to get all those things tested. Uh, next question, she was told that she had androgenic alopecia, which is the genetic form, but have never had any testing. How is this diagnosis made? Alope androgenic alopecia um, can be made by a thorough examination, um, and it can also, of course, be made with biopsy. We rarely recommend biopsies for androgenic alopecia. When we do trichoscopy and we magnify the scalp, we can see um, some hairs that are smaller, some hairs that are bigger. It's this variation that's sort of out of range of normal that, can, um, that we see for androgenic alopecia. So um, we, um, I still do blood work because just because you have androgenic alopecia doesn't mean you have other things that aren't making things worse. 
So for instance, if a woman has androgenic alopecia, we can see that on physical exam, or she comes to me already having a, a biopsy. If you have underlying hormonal issues, if you have underlying vitamin issues, if you have underlying, if you're anemic or your iron levels are low, it's going to excel, accelerate your androgenic alopecia. So it's important that if you have other medical issues going on, that those get ruled out. And even if you don't know that you have them, I, we always do blood work. I, we didn't in the, many years ago, but we do now because there can be other secondary things going on in your body that might be accelerating your genetic hair loss. Okay, now the woman with the pituitary adenoma wants to know if she could be a candidate for PRP. And the answer is maybe. And the reason that I say that is your hormone levels have to be normalized before we would consider PRP. Once your hormone levels are normalized, absolutely, we would consider it. Um, it's just a question of whether those hormones have been properly evaluated and then you treated for them um, so that they're within normal range. If your hormones are out of normal range, the, PAP, the PRP won't be successful. So we wouldn't recommend it. We wouldn't do it until we knew your hormone levels were in normal range. And I will tell you that that's actually very true of testosterone as well. Testosterone use has become increasingly common for women. It's, it was common for men for a long time, but more and more women are taking it postmenopausally. We will not do PRP or OPC treatments on someone who has exogenous or, or other types of testosterone treatments because it just doesn't work as well. And we know this. Testosterone accelerates hair loss in women. And so if you're taking testosterone, then it's, it's going to make it less likely for you to get a good response to any kind of treatment for hair loss. So it's a consideration you need to think about very, very carefully. And, and we, we're a little hard on, on, on that, decision, that decision. We don't, we don't uh, vacillate very much. Um, so again, um, if the hormone levels are within a normal range, then it's definitely worth considering doing um, PRP. Okay, um, I'm not sure what this, I lost part of this question. Something, inflammation on the scalp or in the body. If that person could type the question again, um, unfortunately, we're missing some of it. Uh, Stephanie, um, if you could retype that question. I only got half of it. I don't know why. Oh, oh um, I'll get back to it. Something about inflammation. Um, okay, sorry. I'm sorry, Stephanie. I don't know what, which question was yours initially. If you could just quickly repeat it and I'll go to the next question and we'll get back to you. Um, a woman asked, since November 2019, she's had a lot of stressors, including weight loss surgery in January, using um, minoxidil, light therapy, PRP boosters. Um, it, are you overdoing it? Um, no. <laughs> um, I don't know your specific case at, at this moment. I'd have to review it again. Um, but... Weight loss surgery, unfortunately, when you remove part of the stomach, um, you lose the weight, which is good, um, but the actual stress of the surgery can cause loss, but also the actual um, um, nutritional deficiencies that occur as a result can be ongoing. The stomach is actually important for absorbing certain nutrients from the body. And when they remove the stomach, you lose some of that. You don't lose all of it, but you lose some of it. So even though you may be taking supplements that the doctors give you post-surgery, it may not be enough. So we check all those things fairly regularly. We recommend that you work with your doctor on that. But if you know, it's going to be an ongoing um, struggle to maintain those nutritional uh, levels. Um, plus, um, if you're having ongoing stresses in your life, um, you want to combat those as well. I don't think you're overdoing it at all. I think you're doing everything which is uh, important. And if your hair loss seems to be stabilizing, stick with it. Okay, Stephanie, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, the chronic TE can result from inflammation in the body. White might be some examples of inflammation in the body that could cause chronic TE. Um, I will tell you that chronic stress, just chronic emotional and physical stress, um, it's very hard to measure for that. Um, we have a very inflammatory um, diet in this country. We live a very pro-inflammatory lifestyle. Um, and so the amount of stress that we put ourselves both nutritionally and physically um, um, can cause um, a chronic TE. 
uh, chronic telogen and effluvium. Um, it's, uh, that's why I really recommend the um, anti-inflammatory diet, which um, again is very nutritious and no um, processed foods and, um, but it also can stimulate our, the, the amount of inflammation in our bodies as a result of uh, our own personal stressors can accelerate other diseases, including hair loss. So it's not just hair that gets affected, it's a lot of our other parts of our body. So the effect that stress has and inflammation has on our body is just a fairly recent science in terms of the medical professions. Um, again, there's no, there are some very um, specific blood tests that can be done to see if you have some increased inflammation. Um, and so if you think this is happening to you, there are tests that can be done. There are ongoing studies being done um, right now about the effect of in stress then on inflammation in our bodies. And so um, it's, there are, it's very hard to pinpoint in terms of, you know, specific causes if this is due to stress and, and sort of a, a broad range inflammation. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you more about that. If you wanted to um, speak to me directly, feel free to, to call the office and, and leave a message and I'll be happy to speak to you directly about that. Okay, I think that's all the questions. We've answered them all and I uh, appreciate them. Those were great questions and some very difficult uh, issues um, to deal with. Um, so thank you for joining us today. We'll, we'll, we'll be back again soon for another topic, hopefully. And uh, if you have specific um, topics you'd be interested in having us uh, speak on, please let us know. We're very open to that. So again, thank you for joining us. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Take care, everybody. Stay safe and um, have a good day.